Good morning, good morning. It's a Sunday before Christmas, New Year's Eve. Well, yes, technically it's the Sunday before New Year's Eve too, Richard. Let's get through Christmas Eve first, okay? So we're going to divert a little bit from Hebrews. We're going to focus a little bit on the Christmas story, but I think from a different angle than what I would normally do or what we'll do tomorrow evening, because tomorrow evening we'll have our, again, have our Christmas Eve service. And uh, we'll bounce back and forth tomorrow between Matthew and Luke and read through the whole story as chronologically, chronologically as best as we can. But I thought today, as I was thinking about this, just because I heard a little interesting take on uh, the whole story with Zacharias and, and Elizabeth and, and John the Baptist being born. Obviously, they're his parents. And we'll get to that in a little bit, but it had to do with the meaning of their names. And so I wanted to look at the meaning of the names of as many characters as we can in this story today, this morning. Biblically, or in the Bible, often we see the characters receive their names because of some kind of a, of a trait that is evident in them, oftentimes at birth. Um, sometimes it's changed by God or by somebody else because of a trait that becomes apparent in adulthood. Uh, the names often are are important uh, to the person or to the story. Some were given names of Thanksgiving because parents had waited for a long time for a child to be born. Uh, maybe it was a physical trait like, like Esau, being hairy, being a hairy man, um, different things like that. If you, in fact, if you take the lineages that are, are presented in the first chapter of Genesis, or first couple, cha not first chapter, chapter 4, chapter 5 of Genesis, and you run down the meanings of their names, and I don't have time to, to go through specifically all the meanings of the names, but they're in those meanings, as you take them in order, is embedded the, the gospel itself. It reads something like this, man appointed to death and sorrow. From the presence of God, one comes down dedicated, dying he shall send uh, to the poor and lowly, rest and comfort. That's taking the meanings of all those names and putting them together. And you have a message from God. So I wanted to look at the names and the messages that are in. We may, maybe this will be shorter than normal. I don't know. All of that leading to, obviously, the name that we celebrate the most today. Every day. It should be every day, not just coming up in two days on December 25th or as you look forward to Easter, giving him an honorable mention. Typically, this time of year is a year when there are more people in, in church, or at least it has been in, in the past, more people in church on Christmas and on Easter Mostly to honor mom and dad or grandma and grandpa or, you know, it's just family time, family get-together time. And amongst all the other celebrations of Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, we throw in Jesus. And we almost have to have a hard time even remembering him in some of these times. But that's, that is not how it should be. There are a lot of people that we know through history, a lot of names that we know and recognize. And while I was 
learning about some of them in, in a particular time period of 1809. We'll get to that in just a minute. I think the Lord laid upon my heart to remember those who serve our country today. Whose names we don't know, some of them. Some of them we do because they're family members. So I want to take just a moment. And uh, I don't do this often enough, I don't think. So let's take just a moment. Let's pray for those who are not with family today because they are protecting us and protecting our right to be here today to gather in the name of Jesus to worship and to, to honor him. So let's pray for those men and women now. Father, there are many of our friends and family who have taken on the responsibility to protect this nation, our rights, our constitution. to protect even the ability to celebrate you and even for those who choose to disregard you at this time but still to celebrate and be able to move freely about a nation to be able to have things that other nations do not have though we want to remember those men and women and put them before you today we ask that you would protect them Watch over them, Lord, bring them comfort and peace in a day when they are not with family. But have to carry out a duty that none of us knows or recognizes. They have to live a, a life that we do not have, that we do not have to live. And especially for their leadership, Lord, those who are making the decisions who are trying to inspire them and encourage them. Before our president, their commander-in-chief, Lord, and the decisions that he has to make, we just ask from the top down, Lord, that you would watch over our military, our friends, our family, our sons and daughters, our grandchildren, Lord, keep them safe today. And Lord, I pray that somehow in these next couple of days leading up to this holiday, that they would hear of your name, that they would hear your gospel, and that a revival would begin in our military, that chaplains would speak in your name, And that you'll be honored above everything else. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's start with, well, let's start with the next obvious after, after Jesus. Let's start with Mary and Joseph. Their names. Well, let's, let's not do that. Let's go back to what I kind of mentioned 1809. I had no idea how important this was. <laughs> but in that year, Napoleon was trying to take over the world or take over at least his chunk of the world. And to be honest with you, the only thing I would know and remember about Napoleon is the Battle of Waterloo. And I don't even know the details of that. But back then they would know. That would be the big news. This man trying to uh, make his presence known in his portion of the world. What they wouldn't know are the men who would be being born in that time. And I'm only going to mention two because I've, even though I've heard the list twice in the last 24 hours, I can only remember two. To be, to be honest with you, they represent a good and an evil as far as I'm concerned. But these two men were world changers in their time when they became men. One was Charles Darwin, who was born in that year. 
born sent to seminaries, sent to Christian education to be in the ministry by his parents only to turn against that and embrace a theory or an idea that he had that we call evolution and is still, by the way, just a theory and an idea and nothing provable, although we teach it to our children as fact. And it directs and redirects away from God. The other man who I have always, even from a, a kid held in high honor, my brother, one of my brothers shares a birthday with him, is Abraham Lincoln. In my opinion, the, the greatest, if not one of the greatest, obviously one of the greatest, but still in my opinion, the greatest president because of the time that he was there in our nation's history. And there were many other. There, there were statesmen of England being born at the same time and, and others. But they're all being born at the same time that Napoleon is dominating the world. And nobody knows who these babies are. I mean, our president was born in a log cabin in, in complete obscurity. And what God did to elevate these men, all born in that same year. And there's five or six of them at least. That became well known. Edgar Allan Poe is one of them. Born in that same year that became great men of influence in whatever sphere God put them in. But at the time of their birth, nobody knew who they were or where they were. And the same thing would be with Jesus. He didn't come in with a, a, a grand entourage, although we see uh, angels a host of angels that show up and, and report the, the happenings to, uh, to shepherds. So what we might look at as and be even tempted to exalt as great beings because they serve in the throne room of God now, go to the lowest of their time, the shepherds who, if I remember right, were not even allowed to testify in a court of law. They were kind of looked at as the, the, the cowboys that we had in our wild west. They didn't have a great reputation. But God sent a message to them first. But there were two who had the message before that. More than two, but the two who received it first in Mary and Joseph. And this morning... We read, or I read Mary's, uh, it's called Mary's Song. When she's received the news, when she's received the, uh, the information of what's going to happen to her, what she's been chosen to do. And she has a choice. It's, sometimes we look at that as there, really there was no choice. But she has a choice to receive it or reject it. In fact, she even... She, it, makes that obvious in her re response to it. Let it be done to your maidservant as you have said. She puts herself in that lowly spot. Let me, let it happen to your servant. But Mary's name is kind of interesting. It has a double meaning. It has a good meaning and a bad meaning. It can be wished for a child. You know, and if you're a parent who ever longed for a child, who went a long time without a child, and then all of a sudden you get the news that you have one on the way, and, and we have experienced that, it does bring great joy to your life when you find out, hey, it's been a long time, and now all of a sudden we have this responsibility, but still this joy coming into our life. But it can also mean rebellion and bitter. In the meanings of Mary's name, the first being something that brings joy and the other one the response that could be bitter or rebellious. Kind of plays out in her story, doesn't it? She has the opportunity. I mean, she's raised in Nazareth. She's in a place there is not a lot of good coming out of. Um, is it uh, 
Philip that goes and finds Nathaniel and says, hey, we found the Messiah. He's, he's come from Nazareth. And, and Nathaniel's response is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's where this young woman is growing up. She's living there. She could easily, by her age, have been defiled. But I think because of what we see in her character, both in her response to the news from Gabriel and in her interaction with Elizabeth, because of that, we see her character was not toward the second meaning of her name in bitterness or rebellion, but that she was faithful and she brought joy to those who were around her, or at least they had an opportunity to have some kind of joy from Mary. Elizabeth certainly gets to have that when she goes to visit her, finding out that Elizabeth is also pregnant. And as soon as she enters into the room, and as soon as Mary begins to speak, John, still being in the womb, leaps with joy. Elizabeth says, how do I even have this honor that the mother of my Lord would be here? And, and here's an older woman who's should be beyond the age of being able to bear a child, has been barren all of her life, and yet she has received this great honor. And here is the mother of Jesus, a young, young woman, probably teenager, who has also received this great honor. And they're going to interact and they're going to learn how, or well, Mary maybe goes to learn from from Elizabeth. I don't know. I don't know even why she would leave mother and father other than to hide for a little while because in that acceptance of what's going to happen to her, she's accepting a lot, not just bearing the king of kings, not just being the mother of Jesus. She is going to be shunned by everyone. She has an opportunity or there's a possibility even at that point that she could be shunned by Joseph. And we know from Matthew reading his story that that was his intent. Although he was a good man, his intent was to put her away. To do it quietly, to try to bring as little shame on her as possible, but to put her away. When he could have taken her to the city square, to, to the elders, and they could have brought judgment upon her, she could have even been stoned to death because they were betrothed to one another. That wasn't broken as easily as our engagements are here in, in, in our world, in our culture. Here, if you get tired of the guy before you get married to him, you just take your ring, you chuck it at him, and everything's done. You know, for whatever reason. But there, that promise was a legal and binding promise. And it, had, it could only be broken by divorce. It was, it was that binding. So he, he could have to be found with child and betrothal and know that it was not Joseph's. And we see from insults hurled at Jesus that the people of his area knew that he was not Joseph's. When they would say to him, to Jesus himself, we know who our father is. It was public knowledge that he was not Joseph's. She would have to carry that. Joseph, on the other hand, a carpenter, and his name means may God add or increase. Now, he too gets this news, I'm assuming first from Mary. And again, he intends to put her away quietly because he's a good man. It says he says he's a good man. And didn't want to make a public spectacle of her in, in Matthew chapter one. And yet... He has a, a vision or a dream of an angel coming to him and saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to take her as your wife. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she'll bring forth a son and you, you, Joseph, shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. 
Now Joseph again has to make a decision. Because all of a sudden his name, which may be the hope of, of his parents, may be even his own hope. I mean, think about it. Every time somebody calls his name, what he hears is, may God add. May God increase. His name is a blessing. And he's going to take on to what the rest of the world will look like a dishonor. He won't look like he has the favor of God. The idea that he was a carpenter, so he was a wealthy man, is not necessarily true. That's something that our, our uh, prosperity people like to put out there in an effort to make things look much shinier than they really were. It, it, it doesn't say anywhere that he was a man that had any, I mean, he was obviously had some reputation within his local community of being a just man, but it doesn't say that he was prominent. It doesn't, it doesn't say that because he was a carpenter and a businessman that he was wealthy. As a matter of fact, when they go to the temple to dedicate Jesus, they take the offering of a poor person, the offering of a dove. They don't take a lamb. They can't afford a lamb. They take the offering that is allowed by the law for the poor. When they go to Bethlehem, when another great prominent person, Caesar, makes this declaration, this, this, the man who is in charge of the known world at that time, the world leader decides he wants to see if he's getting all the tax money he's supposed to be getting. And so he has everybody go back to where they were born. And, you know, it looks like he's in charge, right? He gives an issue. He issues a decree. He puts it out there. Everybody follows it. Everybody goes where they're supposed to go. Nobody's going to go against Caesar. And yet we know that God used Caesar. Caesar was not that big. God is in control of this whole thing. But when they go back to Bethlehem, there should be family members there willing to take them in. No doubt if she had not been pregnant, but they were still betrothed to one another, well, they wouldn't even be together yet. Mary would still be at home. Joseph would be adding on to his father's house. This decree would come. He would go and be counted, but she would stay at home, still preparing for the wedding. So he's had to take her in. The marriage has probably had to take place ahead of time. And when they go, there's no family welcoming them into the area, into Bethlehem. It's not just that they showed up in the local hotel was not available because so many people had come to town. They showed up and there was no place for them anywhere. And it's likely our Lord was not born in a, a little makeshift barn or even in a cave as much as in the alleyway in Bethlehem. Where animals would be left who couldn't be housed anywhere else to eat. Late in that manger. There's, there, there's nothing beautiful about the arrival of our Savior. We make it beautiful. We make it something that we want to look at. We make it a story that seems great and grand. Because we know who he is. Because it's what we want. If we could have done it differently, he would have been born in a palace in the presence of noblemen. With a great feast happening while it happened. People bringing gifts from all over the place to honor the new king. And yet we see three wise men show up a couple of years later and they come to Herod and when they say to Herod, hey, where's the new king? And Herod panics. And he asks his, his advisors, where is the king of the Jews supposed to be born? Well, in Bethlehem. 
And he issues the decree, everybody, three years and younger, all boys, three years and younger to be killed. But he tricks the wise men. You go and you find out where he's at, or he tries to. You go, you find out where he's at. And when you found him, you come back and tell me so I can go and worship too. And them being warned in a dream or in a vision not to go back, they leave in a different way, which just, you know, torques Herod off even more. So we have Mary, who's made a choice. We have Joseph, who has made a choice. To take on the, the disgust of the rest of the world around them. For the sake of the Savior. It's the same choice we have. He is leaving a bad taste in the mouths of many, many people around the world. There are many who are angry that we would be here today even talking about him. There are many who are angry in our culture, in our world, if we speak his name on the street. Whether we say it directly to them or not, doesn't matter. If they have to hear it, they're angry. For them, his, word, his name is, is only for curses and nothing else. We have a choice. What the world thinks is dishonorable. Do we honor that in spite of the world? Do we follow him? Do we make the choice to follow him no matter what's going to cost us? Knowing that there is a reward. You can only imagine the reward that Joseph will receive on the day that rewards are given out for having followed through and, and taking Mary on as his wife and raising his adopted son, Jesus, to be who the angel said he would be. Believing in the scriptures that were spoken that he would have known and learned in synagogue about the Messiah. Watching them beginning to come out in his adopted son. Now, we don't know how long Joseph lived. We know that Mary had other sons and daughters. So it wasn't like Joseph just, you know, he was there for the birth and then ceased to exist. He didn't die right away. He had a time of influence and he had a time of watching over. And we know that Jesus goes to the temple and at 13 years old or so, he stays in the temple to, to debate with the, the rabbis and Mary and Joseph forget him. And they start heading home in the caravan. And they have to go back and find him. So Joseph was around for a while to watch him grow into a young man. Let's talk about Zacharias and Elizabeth and John. I've already mentioned them. Zacharias, you remember, was... Well, and Elizabeth, they're both kind of old. They're getting up there in, in their years. They're beyond childbearing years. But Zacharias is part of a priestly family, and he has to go in and, and take his turn to serve in the temple. And while he's there, Gabriel shows up. Say, hey, guess what? Got some good news for you. You're going to be a father. Now, you're already working in the temple. Now you have an angel show up while you're in there, and you don't believe him. You're like, you've got to be kidding me. You're crazy. I'm too old to have a... <laughs> and, and Gabriel's like, wait a minute. Do you... Look at me. You know who I am. You know, you know that I am not just a man. I'm bringing you a message from the God you serve. That you have a, rep you have a, a responsibility. You have willingly, faithfully taken on a responsibility to represent this God to the people... And you don't believe the message that is sent to you in a, in a supernatural way. It's not just some, you know, feeling inside. It's not some warm, fuzzy thing. It, it's, it's not a prophet coming to you. It's the angel, Gabriel, 
that is coming to you. So until the baby's born, you don't speak another word. Until you're ready to give him his name, you don't get to talk. So how do you go out and convey that to your wife? Guess what? You're going to be pregnant. What? Yeah, you're going to have a child. How do you do that? I mean, that's like 2,000-year-old Pictionary probably, right? You got to draw the pictures. You got to, you know, write it out. Hopefully, if she can't read, somebody else can read because who knows what the education level would have been for anybody else. But we don't, I don't think it said that he's a scribe. So we don't even know if he can write. And then the baby's finally born and, and everybody's going to, we're going to name him after his father. And finally he can speak. No, his name is John. Zacharias means God remembers. God remembers. In his old age, God remembered his faithful man who served in the temple, even though, and it didn't surprise God that Zacharias didn't believe. God's not surprised by any of us. But he remembered him. And Elizabeth's name means the promise of God or the oath of God. And John's name means grace, the grace of God. You put their names together, like, that, like the, the lineage we talked about in the beginning of Genesis. It means putting them together. God remembers his oath of grace, his promise of grace. It would essentially be the message that John would preach. Repent. God wants to have a relationship with you. God wants to be a part of your life. It's time for Israel to have a new relationship with God. Come and be baptized. Repent of your sin. Turn back to God. He's remembered his oath and his promise. And grace is here. God will forgive. Gabriel, while we mentioned him, the champion of God or the man of God. I mean, if you name your son Gabriel, you should have great hope for him. The champion of God or the man of God. Well, since Gabriel's not a man, he certainly fits, though, the, the idea of the champion of God. Some call him another archangel beside Michael. I don't know that he's actually that. It would seem the only one the Bible actually refers to as an archangel is Michael. That he's the one and only as far as we know. But Gabriel's name puts him at a high honor and a high rank within the, the angelic realm. He is often seen as the one who brings a message straight from the throne of God to whoever is praying. He comes to Daniel. He brings great messages from God to Daniel. And we know that he fights. He's not just a messenger angel. In fact, when he comes to Daniel, he, he says, I was held up by, by the prince of Persia. And when I go back, I have to fight the prince of Greece. I was able to break through because Michael, the archangel, came to my rescue, came to my aid. I don't, I don't know, I don't have any desire, I don't think, to meet any other angels but those two. Strictly because they are the two that were mentioned and we know a little bit about them. But to, to, to stand and, and to see them. these servants of, of God. And John has an experience with an angel in Revelation where he's just so overwhelmed by all the information that's given to him that he falls down and begins to worship. And the angel says, no, you don't worship me. I'm just a fellow servant. I, I, I serve the same God that you do. 
So you don't worship me. We worship. You worship, I worship, we worship. But he's given these messages to take to Mary, to Zacharias, to Joseph. The announcement of the Son of God leaving the throne room of God to take on human flesh. And we read in Hebrews, he, he, he does not think it robbery to or stealing to still be considered or to be looked at or to be known as God. But he took on the form of human flesh so that he could be the sacrifice for us. So he could fulfill the roles that we've been looking at in Hebrews as the, the high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek and not Aaron. To fulfill so many scriptures. For, for Gabriel to make and take messages to Daniel pointing to this time and then being able to show up at that time and, and, and bring messages to those who are involved in fulfilling some of the prophecies that he brought to Daniel. He never does anything but give honor to God. He is one who has seen Satan fall. And a third of the angels fall. And he stayed and he served God. And he, he, he serves without hesitation. He tells Daniel, from the moment you began to pray, I was sent with a message. He didn't hesitate. He didn't. He left right then. It's time to go. Boom. He is a faithful servant and a champion of God. Certainly, I would think a name for us to try to aspire to. To, to be a man or a woman of God. One who is a faithful servant. One who will carry the message that's given. The message of the gospel. Because it has been given to you and it's been given to me. To take out into this world. Not, not to hold up. Not to grab a hold of and, and keep to ourselves. It is the message from almighty God that has been conveyed to us. And we have been given the, the orders to go in the Great Commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creatures, and everywhere we go, make disciples. So not just preach, but teach. And that commission has been given to all of us, and not just the 12, not just the preachers and pastors, but to all of us. It has been handed down to all of us. Gabriel is a great example of that faithful servant that we should hope to be. Mary, again, Joseph, faithful servants. Zacharias, a faithful servant, even in the temple of God. You think about it, we were, we were, we've been talking about how the temple and the tabernacle and the things, the articles and all that are in there and the priests that serve, they're all all shadows and types of Jesus. They're not the original, but they're shadows. What if Zacharias, as a man, as a shadow of the throne room of God in heaven, has the same job as, as Gabriel in heaven to be the message bearer, to go into the, to the holy place of God and then to come out with a message from God to the people because certainly he would have had the responsibility of teaching the people the things of God. That kind of just explains all the more the indignation of Gabriel with Zacharias. What are you talking about? What do you mean you don't believe? What do you mean you can't receive this? You know? We have Anna and we have Simeon when Jesus is brought to the temple. 
Simeon's response, the one of my favorite parts of the whole story, the, to read his response to the whole thing. In Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 25, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and his and this name was just and this man, I'm sorry, was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Another another devout man, a, a servant of God. And the Holy Spirit is on this man. And verse 26 says, And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring a revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. When Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him, then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, to marry his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword shall pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. It's destined for the rise and the fall of many. Mary's heart is going to be Pierce through like a sword. That the thoughts of many may be revealed. Literally, you're going to, you're going to see horrible things. You're going to hear horrible things. Said to, said about your son. This isn't going to be an easy life. Simeon gets to depart in peace. I've reached the end. I, the fulfillment of God's promise to me. Right? He's lived long. He's served faithfully. All he was waiting for was to see the Messiah. And he's not complaining that he's not seeing Messiah take over. That he's not seeing Messiah as a man as a full grown man, he's not seeing him setting the, the world in order. He just gets to see him as a child, as a baby, he can take him in his hands and he can bless him and he can bless the, the, the parents, but to take him in his hands and to worship before God, you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. See, when we will receive God's word into our life, peace is what we get. Simeon's name means obedient. And he had waited, it would seem, for a long time. And had been obedient in spite of everything that was going on around him, in spite of Rome, in spite of, of, of false teachers, in, in spite of false messiahs, in spite of everything that could possibly go wrong in that ancient time, Simeon was obedient to the will and to the law of God. Another man who sought to serve God with all of his heart. An old man. As if the Lord does not come back soon, like I believe he will, but if it takes time, I want to be an old man that can have that said of me, that I've been obedient, that I have served him well, that my life has been spent for him in spite of whatever circumstances I have to face. That's my hope. My hope is, is to see him. We, we read that again in Hebrews 
in the last couple of weeks that to those who eagerly wait to see him, he will appear to them a second time. We have an example of, some, of one who waited eagerly to see the Messiah. The promises that come. And listen, if you have a bucket list that you need to start checking off, that's the only one that should matter. I hear people all the time like, you know, yeah, I, I want Jesus to come back, but I'd like to do this first. I'd like to experience this first. I'd like to get married first. I'd like to have parent, or kids first. I'd like to have grandkids first. I'd like to have, I'd, I'd like to go climb Mount Everest first or whatever their, whatever their bucket list is. You know, I'm telling you, you won't care. When that big check gets marked off, when you see the Messiah, all the other stuff goes away. Mount Everest will not stand before the Messiah. But you will. And if you're born again, you follow him with all your heart. You seek after him. He, he is the thing in your life. He is the one in your life. Then you will stand before him. If you are eagerly waiting to see him. Not because you have your own ideas of who he is. I think there's a lot of people out there waiting to see the Messiah because they think he's going to show up the way they want him to. But if you are willing, if you are eagerly waiting to see him because you can't think of anything else, you, he, he is, the, the, you want to see him the way the Bible describes him. You can't wait to bow at his feet. Then you have the heart of Simeon. And that will motivate you and that will drive you to be obedient to him in this life. And when you fail, it will drive you to repentance immediately. Seeking his forgiveness. Not re-seeking salvation, but seeking his forgiveness again. I, I can't have anything in the way of this relationship with him. And as you read his word and you study his word, you're going to be more and more enveloped in it. You're going to be more and more drawn to it. You're going to love it more and more. You're going to cherish it more and more. That won't stop. And then you have Anna, which is the Greek form of Hannah. It's a favor or grace of God. It's the feminine form of John. Verse 36 of Luke chapter 2 says, Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of uh, Phenuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was of great age, of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was, with, uh, was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And coming in, or coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord who, and spoke of him to all those who, who look for redemption in Jerusalem. So you have Anna, a prophetess, one who has dedicated her life, was only married for a short time, from a very young age, from her virginity, it says, to one man, married for only seven years, and was a widow then for 84 years. Now listen, these long lengths of life were not common in that culture in that time. God had honored them with sustaining them for a long period of time to be able to see the promised one, the Messiah. And she walks into this scene with Simeon just rejoicing and she knows She 
she has been serving in the temple in whatever way a woman was allowed. Praying and fasting night and day. Completely dedicated to the Lord, to the Messiah that she had never seen yet. Knew he was promised to Israel. I don't know that she had the same promise given to her directly that, that Simeon had. But you get the impression that Simeon had made this promise that was made to him known. Because she walks into the scene and she too begins to rejoice. If Simeon says this is the Messiah. And she being a prophet, a prophet is one who is, who is serving the Lord. Who is full of the Holy Spirit herself. Knows it's true. And you have two witnesses now outside of Mary and Joseph who have verified this is him. And she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Everybody she knew that was looking for the Messiah. All of her friends, all of her family that she knew like her and Simeon were longing for the Messiah to come, she spoke to all of them about Jesus, about the baby. The Messiah is ready. The Messiah is here. You wonder how many of them responded like Zacharias. You got to be kidding me. A baby? I'm never going to see him come to power. I'm never going to see, you know. But on the other hand, you see the shepherds receive the news and they go in and they speak to everybody that they that will listen to them and tell them about the angels and tell them that they've seen the Messiah, the baby has been born. And Anna is the same. I've seen him. I've touched him. This is John writes kind of in the same fashion in 1 John when he says he was made manifest to us. He was made real. We saw him. We touched him. We handled him. He's here. He has been here. He'll be back. There's one name left that I can think of right now. It is the name above all names. It is the name that that was told to Mary and and to to Joseph. See if I can find the other scripture I'm looking for here, but we were told his name would be Emmanuel, which means God with us. It has been testified to him, and that was a that was a prophecy of the Old Testament scriptures that that's what he would be called. The idea, even within the church, that he wasn't really God is wrong. It's just wrong. He was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. He never ceased to be God. We looked at that again at the beginning of Hebrews. We're told in Philippians. I believe it's in Philippians. I lost my mark here, but that his name would be the name above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord of all to the glory of God the Father. Every knee should do this. Everyone should take that. Now, before it's too late, 
when Gabriel tells Joseph, your name, you'll call him Joseph, or you're going to call him Jesus. In the Hebrew, it's Joshua. God's salvation. Jesus comes from the, the Latin later on. But his name, he would have been running around being called Joshua. The one who brings God's salvation. There were many Joshua's in his time. And we know of an Old Testament Joshua that took over for Moses that led the children of Israel into their salvation. That led them into the promised land. There was a great warrior that carried out the promises of God. That walked in faith even before the generation that had to pass away. He and Caleb alone were willing to go now and fight giants. And even, even when they finally get in there, and they're the only two from that generation allowed in. And when they get there and the lots are being cast for where they will live and what part of the nation, the, what tribes will be where and who will live in those areas. And, and Caleb says, give me the mountains. He says, giants are still there. And I want to go after him. I wanted to go 40 years ago, and I still want to go now, 80-some years old, and he's ready to still go fight giants. Can you imagine the smile on Joshua's face? Can you imagine the two of them over that 40 years getting together and talking about what they had seen in the land and wishing they could go even then, but had to grow up to be old men and be patient and wait for the promises of God. Listen, it's no exaggeration for me to say I have been waiting for Jesus to come back since I've been old enough to know that he was coming back and understand it. I was sure he would have been back by now. I know he's coming. Whether I see him today or I see him when I'm a really old man instead of just an old man, I know he's coming. And I'm longing to see him. He was faithful to come that day. He didn't come a day early. He didn't come a day late. He came on the prescribed day. A day determined by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before let there be light. To grow up and become the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. All of it was already there, all in place, ready to go. Just waiting for the day when the Father said, let's start this now. He carried out his mission to absolute completion. He fulfilled more prophecies than anybody else could have ever even come close to. So many that it's an astronomical number as far as odds are concerned that he could have even done it. To even just take a handful of, if I were to say to you he fulfilled 20 prophecies specific to the Messiah in his first coming, that's an astronomical number in odds that a man, one man, could fulfill 20 specific prophecies at exactly the right moment. The odds of that happening are astronomical for 20. Now, depending on which scholar you read, it's at least 300 Old Testament prophecies that he has fulfilled. Some say 600. There's that many more for his second coming. I don't care if it's 20. I don't care if it's 600. I don't care if it's 300. It's happening. And it'll be complete. 
There are prophecies concerning his second coming that are already in play. Israel being back in the land. At the forefront, of my mind anyways. He's coming. The men that we have had as president for the last 15 years. Our men have taken us down this road in our nation to pull us back out of the way so that the door can be wide open for more prophecies to begin to be, be, filled, be fulfilled right now. Whether they were good or whether they were bad. God has used them to put us in the place that we need to be. Exactly as he said he would. The world leaders around the world are put in place by God to do according to his will and not even their own. That's why when they speak, you will oftentimes hear scripture coming out of their mouth. They don't even know. They have no idea. It's moving so fast right now. Jesus said it would be like birth pains. And I, and, I, and I told you that I've known for as long as I have been able to comprehend, I have been looking for him to come back in my lifetime. And, and maybe he won't. It's up to him. It's his schedule, not mine. The father will tell him when to come and get his bride. And that's when he'll come. He won't come a day early or a day late. But I'm telling you, I have watched the birth pains happen. As the things begin to expand, or as they begin to increase with intensity, and then they back off. And then they come again. And now they're increasing with intensity and with frequency. To the point of they're almost running into each other. When that happens in labor, it's just about time for the baby to be born. Any minute. Any second. Now the apostles lived and taught like Jesus could come back at any moment, even in their lifetime. They looked for him to return then. In fact, they were looking so intently and so intent on not looking in any other direction. An angel had to come when Jesus ascended into heaven and say, listen, guys, what are you doing? You can't stay here. This same Jesus that you saw ascend into heaven is going to come back in the same way. But for now, you need to start doing what he told you to do. And they lived. One eye looking up and one eye looking straight ahead. Kind of gives a funny picture, doesn't it? But it's what they did. They, they were focused on the here and now and doing and being obedient. But they were always looking up. They were always looking up. Ready, eager, waiting to see the Messiah. Waiting to see him come again. And John even ends Revelation with, even so, Lord Jesus, come, and come quick. The anticipation of him showing up at any moment, calling his church out at any moment, that anticipation of that moment should drive us to speak the gospel and preach the gospel to everybody who will listen. Because just like in that time, Anna went to all who were looking for the redemption that would come through Messiah, there are still people out here looking for redemption. There are people in our country who have not heard this name. In our country, the Christian nation. There are many people out there saying, we're, a, we're still a Christian nation. We were established on the, on the, the scriptures and the, the, the laws of God. And, and our, our laws were formed by biblical law. And those who signed the Declaration of Independence, many of them had gone to seminaries and were preachers. And, and it's all true. But in our nation... There are people who have never heard the name of Jesus in any form other than in attached to a curse. And you don't have to go to some obscure place in our nation, some barren ground, some high mountain, some you know piece of, of 
country where hardly anybody goes, where there's few people living, you don't have to go to that. The two people I have run into, one has been in Kalamazoo, living in the city among churches on every corner, and the other here in our little town in Three Rivers with churches all over the place. Never heard a single story from the Bible. Never. 20-somethings. 20-somethings. I'm not talking about little kids. 20-somethings who had never been to church, never heard a single story from the Bible. Did not know anything. I mean, listen, in our country, you you it's Christmas time. Somehow in their life, all they ever saw was lights and trees. Never wondered what any of the nativities that set out are about. Didn't have any idea what it had anything to do with Christmas. In, in civil, populated, not civilized, populated areas. And they don't know who he is. They've never heard the story. They don't know that somebody thought so much of them that there's a God in heaven who thought so much of them that he would come and be a man and die for them and come back to life so they can live. They didn't even know they needed anything. The world is doing its job. It's going beyond blurring the lines of who God is to effectively blinding people to who he is or that he even exists. Those two men I mentioned, born in 1908. I'm sorry, 1809. Got it backwards there. Darwin and Lincoln. One, we have writings and books that fly in the face of God. That deny who God is. That deny God had anything to do with with creation, with, with you being here. You, as far as he was concerned, a complete accident of nature. The other, we have writings, we have declarations that proclaim the truth of the living God. In his monument, his memorial in Washington, his speeches are written in the walls in stone, and in that are biblical references over and over again. They came into this world in spite of Napoleon and what he was doing. They came in quiet. They went out loud and in opposition to one another. They were, in effect, world changers. Not that they expected to be. I don't, I don't know that Darwin in all of his writings ever thought people would actually listen to him and, and have this, this wickedness put out in front of that would deny God. That would be in opposition to the Bible. And I don't know that Lincoln ever thought of being president before he was. I don't know what their intents were when they were growing up. It would seem one was on a path of righteousness and being obedient to God, and that's all he cared about. It was a part of his life. And as a lawyer and everything else that he did, he did it, it would seem, to honor God. And he did. He brought freedom to people. The other one brought bondage to people because it pulls them away from God. What are we going to do? 
you think you're insignificant? You think, yeah, I'm just, you know, small town nobody. You weren't born in a log cabin. You have access to people you don't ever even see because you have social medias that you can use to get the gospel out. Most of the people that that listen to us, I've never met. You don't know. You don't know. You, You who are younger, you don't know. Look at Mary and Joseph. I'm sure didn't expect this when they were first betrothed to one another. Zacharias and Elizabeth and Anna and Simeon in old age didn't expect this given to them. Well, Simeon did. The other three were just hoping. (laughs) Simeon knew. But they didn't, whether they had little life left or whether they had a long life left, they didn't hide it. They didn't keep him a secret. They didn't say this is just between me and God. And even if people said that to them, that's fine. You believe what you want to believe. That's between you and God. But you don't have. You don't need to say it to anybody else. You don't need to try to, to, to teach anybody else. You don't need to put it in front of anybody else. The Bible commands it. And listen, if you're listening today or you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't know who that little baby in that little basket is that's sitting out in your neighbor's yard. It's a shadow. It's a type of who Messiah was, that Jesus came as a baby. And likely whatever depiction you see of him is a lot cleaner than what he came into. A lot grander than what he came into. Nonetheless, he came with a mission to preach God's word with understanding. To let everybody know the kingdom is near you now. To go to a cross. To have men put him on a cross. To beat him until he was not recognizable anymore. To nail him to a cross. A death of shame. To have three hours of darkness when he took on the wrath of God the Father. To be able to come through that and say, painful. It's finished. To take his last breath, to be laid in a tomb for three days, to come back out and conquer death. So that you can know. So that you know that redemption is there for you. The life that you think is broken and lost can be redeemed and made something beautiful in the sight of God. So that you can know that he's coming back for you. That you will live again. That you have eternal life with him according to John chapter 3. Eternity. No more days, no more nights. It's not even measurable by anything. Just forever with him. Never to be away from him again. And for now you have the promise of the Holy Spirit who will walk with you, who will fill you, who will empower you to say and do things you don't think you can. Who will inspire you to things that you don't even imagine right now.
You have to make a decision to believe and to receive it. Romans says that if you will believe in your heart, I'm sorry, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And again, later in that same chapter, Romans 10, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's for you today. Don't resist it. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, today, if you will hear the word of the Lord, do not harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation in another place. Don't wait. Because those of us who are eagerly waiting, hoping it could be any second. We know it could be any second. There's not one prophecy that has to be fulfilled before the rapture can happen. Not one. All that is left can be done after we're gone. If you have been hearing the voice of God, if you've been hearing the Holy Spirit draw you in, if you have been longing to know forgiveness of your sin, if you have been longing to experience redemption, to know that your life matters to somebody, it matters to Jesus, the writer of Ephesians, Paul said that you are an inheritance to God if you will give over to him. That he sees value in you when you think you have no value left. Trust in him today. Cry out to him today. Ask him to forgive you of your sin. Enter into salvation. Know the love of the true and living and almighty God today. Let's pray. Father, we we ask for that. What a... <laughs> What a great present that would be for us to hear friends and family members saying, I gave my heart to the Lord. And Lord, I pray that that would be the gift that we would give. Salvation. The message of salvation. Not that we save, you save. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. But Lord, to be obedient that would be our gift to you. To share the gospel, that would be our gift to everyone else. Lord, motivate us to that. And the return would be the blessing of hearing the stories of lives changed. Well, Lord, most of all, we want to celebrate you this, this week. Lord, I pray that we would celebrate you every day. But this day opens up opportunities and so Lord, I pray that we would share your story with our children, with our grandchildren, with our nieces and nephews. of how the Savior of the world came to bring salvation, to bring truth, and to bring life. And Lord, as we are obedient to honor you, we know that you will honor your word and you'll speak to the hearts of those who are around us. We know you will be faithful. Help us to be faithful. In spite of circumstance and in spite of, of, of situations. Help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.